Our next speaker is a PhD dropout. And right after he dropped out of his PhD, he moved to DC and was a Segway tour guide. And he felt the need to constantly apologize to all the DC natives for blocking their way with Segways. So please welcome Alex to the stage. Thanks so much for being here uh, today and, and uh, for coming to talk about reliably reproducible artifacts. I was so proud when I thought of this. Like, I probably should have thought of it a long time ago, but I, I was really proud of this fun. Um, so again, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm a manager on the solutions engineering team at our studio. Um, you can tweet at me at Alex K. Gold and the slides and other stuff are not currently, but will be available um, on my website at alexkgold.space slash speaking. Um, so we're going to start off just talking a little bit about reproducibility and, and what's up with reproducibility. And then we'll get into some of the like real nitty gritty how and why. We're going to try and get through our end, our studio package manager and Docker in the next 19 minutes and 30 seconds. So like buckle up. It's going to be a wild ride. All right. So why should we care about reproducibility in, in general? And, and you know, the, the, the obvious answer here is that like you want to share with others or, or with future you. Um, and that's that's a really common reason. The, the other answer, and this is often true of particularly if you're in like a heavily regulated or a government industry is like, you don't have an option, right? Like you just have to make things reproducible. You have archival and, and reproducibility requirements that, that you have to meet. And so like, what, what is reproducibility? I, I think of these three as synonyms is like reproducible, self-contained, portable are like those are those are all sort of uh you know uh, uh intermingled to to me in terms of how i think about reproducibility and so then the, the question becomes like you know how do i make things reproducible and, and and first it's important to think about like how reproducible does something need to be right Th things can be sort of not at all reproducible right like you can never run it again it's never going to work again that's obviously probably bad for the most part unless it's like really a one-off kind of thing it could be like somewhat reproducible, right? Like it, it runs, but you got to spend some time sort of getting it up and running. And like, there are conditions where like it would probably break in the future, or you could get to like fully reproducible, which I think is usually an illusion, but like, you know, way really reproducible. And, 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 you know, you can move up the spectrum of, of reproducibility, but also the thing is as things get more reproducible, they, they get to be, it's more work. It's harder to be more reproducible. And, and so it's worth thinking about for the projects you're working on, what's the right level of reproducibility for the thing you're, um, you're, you're working on. Uh, you know, again, oftentimes for um, things with the, the government or with the public sector um, or with, um, you know, regulated industries that you don't have an option, but sometimes you do and, and you have to choose the, the sort of appropriate spot to be on, on the spectrum. I think about reproducibility for data science is falling along sort of like there are three um, three things. And I have to say that this is the only pie chart that has ever appeared in a presentation of mine. And it is purely to have three colors on the screen. So, you know, don't don't hate me too bad. Uh, but the, the, the three uh, sort of components of reproducibility for data science, I think of as being the code, right? Can your actual code be reproducible? Uh, does it run? <laughs> um, things like setting random numbers, right? Do you have a stable way to, to get random numbers into your code where you need them? Uh, data, can you get the same data through your code over and over again? Or, or does your data sort of change every time you run your, your code? And the environment, uh, can you actually set up a place where your code can run that, that's reliable? And, and today, for, for the purpose of this talk, we're really just talking about the environmental piece, the code and the data. There's lots and lots of good tools and writing and resources out there. I highly recommend you check them out. That's that's not what we're talking about. So we're going to start talking at the level of R packages and, and reproducing your R package environment. So let's, let's take a hypothetical set of three interconnected packages you might use in your analysis. So we'll, we'll say we have the packages bplyr and tidys. They have a dependency that they share on slang. So when I go install that package bplyr tidys, I get all of them in my, um, in my project. Let's say, for the sake of argument, all version 1.0. Well, now some time passes and I need to do this again, or somebody else needs to do this on their machine. Um, you know, some, sometime later, like what versions am I going to get with, I install that package just doesn't specify versions. And so I, I don't know. And this is bad, right? This is a bad place to be. Uh, it's very irreproducible. And I would say this is sort of like the bottom level of reproducibility, right? So the first level, uh, uh is to just get those packages, those package versions recorded so that they can be sort of stably restored. And, and the way to do that is with the RN package. 
Um, and this does, does two things. It creates a, a lock file for archiving and sharing and a project specific library to protect projects one from, from the other. And we'll talk a little more about this in a minute. At, at the next level, right, what happens if I archive a project and need to resurrect it years later? So let's say, let's go back to this project I had. I used RN, so I've got my project. I still have Slang, Bplyr, and TidyS 1.0 in them. And I come back two years later and I want to install, say, EEplot4 for the popular plotting library. And at this point, EEplot4 has moved along, so it's at version 1.2. And but that pulls in Slang 1.2. And I don't know, are Bplyr and TidyS gonna run? Like, uh-oh, that's that's bad. Um, and so we're gonna talk about our Studio Package Manager repository snapshots as a way to fix this, this problem. And so so far, like, you know, you've got your code. We talked about how to reproduce the layer of R and Python packages, and I'll I'll demonstrate it in a little bit that we're not done with that, but but we you know, R and package manager snapshots, but like there are more things down the stack you might have to reproduce. For example, your versions of R and Python, your system libraries, your operating system itself. In some really highly regulated industries, you need to go all the way to the layer of the hardware. If you need to do that, like I don't have any solutions for you. You need to keep a server for 20 years and like that's on you and your IT team. But if you don't need that, you might be able to get some help from Docker, right? Docker is a really popular uh, solution here. Um, it's a tool for creating, saving, and, and quickly restoring computational environments. Um, the biggest benefit of Docker is that you can sort of like take a whole computational environment, save it, and then bring it back months, days, weeks, years later. All you need to do is make sure that your, your host has Docker. You don't need to worry about any of the other things. They'll all be in the container. And, and I'll show you this in a little bit, but the, there are other ways to create virtual environments. Docker's biggest advantage is it's very lightweight. It's very uh, uh, sort of fast to start, and we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. Um, before we, we head into like demoing things, I just want to talk a little about Docker because people here are probably less familiar with, with Docker than some of the other components that, that are, you know, are specific. So just to, to give like a quick, simple mental model on Docker, uh, you have a Docker file. That's code that tells your computer how to build uh, a Docker thing. You build that Docker file into a Docker image. So a Docker image you can think of as like a bunch of compiled code. It's like a .exe, right? It's like, it's there, it's ready to run, it's good to go, but it's not sort of anything on its own. It's just the image. And then you run a Docker image as a container. So a running Docker thing is the running container. Um, the, the image is the sort of frozen snapshot and the file is the, the code that it comes from. There is a little terminology here, right? Like Sometimes people refer to all of this as the container, you know, sort of generally referring to it as the container. Uh, but but it's good to differentiate from a running container versus an image that is not running but is ready to be a running container. Okay, with that, let's go to some demo. Um, I'm actually going to stop sharing and reshare my other screen. And let's pull up our studio. Okay, um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start a new project. We're going to go all the way from new project to Docker container in how much time do I have left? 12 minutes. We got it. We're going to hit it. All right, new directory, new project. Um, I'm starting a new project here in um, in our studio. I'm going to use RN. For those of you who haven't used RN before, um, RN works really nicely to isolate project libraries and help you archive them and save them later. So to like give you a very concrete image of what RM does, if I type library R markdown, well, it's not going to work if I missed if I misspell it. But if I spell it correctly, even there's no R markdown package in here, even though I've installed R markdown dozens of times on my computer. And that's because RM creates an isolated project library. Now, this isn't a big deal because now if I go install dot packages, uh, and I'm going to do a few packages that I know I'm going to need here, just get them all. Uh, we're going to do R markdown, uh, mime, and markdown. What you'll see is that this install is going to be almost instantaneous. And that's because RN keeps a cache uh, of different libraries across my um, uh, uh, across all of my projects. And so that, that's why that install was almost instantaneous there, which is which is pretty nice. I, I, I like that feature. Um, so now that I've got my, my RN project, I've got the libraries I need here. Um, I could, for example, let's bring in an R markdown notebook. Uh, my... Markdown. I'm just using the Hello World one here because it's good enough for, for what I'm trying to demo. And we'll call it my markdown.rmd and we'll save it here. 
So now let's take a look at the rm.lock file. The rm.lock file is the key to this whole operation. Uh, so what you'll see is that it's recorded the version of R that I use. That's 402 here. So if I need to get back to it later, I know what version I need. Uh, it records the repository that I got the packages from. So that can help me restoring packages later. Um, and it records the actual packages I've used. Now, what you'll notice is that there's almost nothing here, just, just RN itself. And that's because I haven't actually used anything. Right? I, I have my markdown document. Um, but if I want RM to recognize that, I have to do the RN. And let me make this window a little bigger so that you can read it more easily, even if it gets a little scrunchy. Uh, I do an RN snapshot. And so what RM snapshot is going to do is it's going to add all of those packages that I need, right? It's going to sort of look through all these files, identify the dependencies, trace out all the dependency trees, and add them all to my, to my little lock file here. So now they're all documented. And you can see you've got the version, the repository. And so now if I take this and I give this to somebody else, right, they can restore all these packages in their environment as well with a simple rn restore command. And they get back the same package environment. Boom. Level one reproducibility achieved. Um, so this is like minimal, to me, minimal package reproducibility. Just use rn. It's good. It, it works really nicely. Use rn. Okay, let's say we want to sort of take things to the next level. And, and remember that, that issue that we had where, okay, now if I come back in a year and I want to install ggplot2, right? By default, what I'm going to get is the current version of ggplot2 that is current a year in the future. And I don't know if that's compatible with the packages I have now. And that, that's not good, right? I, I want to be able to install something that if I want another package in the future, I know it's going to work okay with, with this set. There are also places where you may need to audit, right? Like where did that set come from? And, and, and uh, you know, just saying that I took what was latest on CRAN at the time, right? And that's what that's what this means. Not good enough. So in order to, to get around that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a snapshot of repository. If I can move my, um, sorry, give me one sec, my window out of the way. So I'm going to use RStudio Package Manager. And so what RStudio Package Manager does here, uh, and I'm, this is our public RStudio Package Manager, packagemanager.rstudio.com. I can choose a dated repository. So I'm going to choose today. And you can see this, this repository. It's packagemanager.rstudio.com. It's the repository everything. And it's today's date plus like this hash thing that has to do with the time of day and that sort of thing. Uh, and so now if I copy this, I'm just going to copy this from Package Manager. And I'm going to bring it into RN and just put it here on that repository line. Boom. Now, at any point in the future, if I'm inside this project and I install into this project, I will always be locked to today's date, which is a really good thing, right? Because then I know that my packages will work together nicely in the future, which, which is really great. Um, so now, okay, so level two achieved, right? So now I have a set of packages that I know go with this project. I can share it across projects. Um, and, and just one thing to note is that when you share, RM does some smart things with Git ignores. So for example, if I were just to add this whole folder to my Git repository, um, the rm.lock file would get added and almost nothing else, <clears throat> excuse me, which is really handy because the lock files, right? I, I want to share the, the lock file so other people can reproduce the same library. I don't want to share the actual library because, for example, what if we're going across, across operating systems or something like that? Uh, I don't want to just share the library. I want to share the lock file. Okay. So then what we did, right, is we went to a snapshotted uh, uh, CRAN repository from our studio, public our studio package manager. Um, and what that does is that ensures that in the future, I will always be able to get packages that are sort of concordant with the current state of my library. Okay. Now here's where things are going to get crazy. We're going to head into Docker territory. So we talked a little bit about a Docker file and what that would do. So let's let's pull up a Docker file. So this is a Docker file, um, and it, like every Docker file, it starts with a from statement. So this is like what is the base Docker image? In this case, we're starting with a very very like this is the base of the base, right? It's just a Ubuntu uh, operating system image. It has almost nothing in it. It's like got Ubuntu and like nothing else. Like you can see, for example, here I'm installing Vim and curl. It has nothing in it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm taking this, this very basic Docker image. I'm installing some system libraries and I'm installing R. Now for the purposes of 
this, like if I were just doing this, actually in real life, I would probably just use like the rocker images. If you've never used them before, there's a, a an organization called rocker or R O C K E R. You can Google rocker Docker and they make our Docker images for the community. They're awesome. And you should probably use those if you're doing something as simple as this, just some system libraries and a version of R. But you know, what I wanted to point out here is that if you have specific system libraries, you have version constraints you need to put in, right? You can do this yourself. It's, it's not very hard to build this Docker file. So, or to, to make this Docker file. So th this is my Docker file. This is my base image. Um, so now what I want to show, so now let's, let's, uh, before, before this, I compiled this into an actual image, right? So remember the image is the actual, uh, uh sort of compiled version of this Docker file. So if I do Docker images, and I'm going to look at just the ones that are relevant to today because I have, oh, I gotta go to the terminal console. R doesn't know what to do with a command like Docker images. Um, I'm going to go Docker images DCR star. And so what you'll see is I have uh, uh, this DCR base image, which is that one. We'll get into these others in, in just a sec, although hopefully we won't need backup. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I've got this image now. And so I can do now Docker run uh, DCR 2021 base. Great. So now what's happening is this image is coming up, it's running, and then it's going back down. And, and but nothing happened that that's fine right because there's there's nothing to do here right it's just it's an environment it's ubuntu it has some system libraries it has an r it has r in it but like nothing happens so that's totally fine that's great um i can also the, the other thing that you can do is you can run docker containers in interactive sessions so if i want to do docker run uh it dcr 2021 base you don't need to memorize this if you google it how to run a docker interactive like you'll you'll find it pretty quick uh, bin bash. And so now I've got a terminal right into the running Docker container. And so like, this is a case where even if the container doesn't do anything by itself, right, you can see this is R402 that I've got in the container. This might be useful. Um, in case you're kind of tripped out. Yes, this is trippy to be running R in the terminal in a Docker container from inside our studio. That is weird. Um, now we're out of the Docker container. Okay, so now let's talk about how we're going to archive this particular project. So we've got our, our markdown document here, and let's open up. I have another Docker file that's sort of a project level doc, or not, not a project, like a, a, an app, an app, a doc level Docker file. Um, and we're going to pull that into this project. We're going to pull it into the project. I told Jared before the talk that I was going to live on the edge and do all this live while I also had uh, hop in running. And uh, hopefully that won't bite me in the butt. OK, uh, let's rename this. For some reason, it keeps wanting to name it dockerfile.ocker file, which is not a thing. Cool. So now I've got this, this Docker file that is specific to this piece of content. And actually, while I'm talking, um, I'm going to um, have this uh, build so that you can sort of see how this works. Uh, DCR doc. Okay, so that's going to build uh, dot. That's going to build in the background. Oh, and I forgot that this is called my markdown in the file name. Got to make sure that's up to date. It's going to build for real this time. Uh, so you can see that that's all happening in the background. So here's what this Docker file does. It starts from that DCR 2021 base. It copies in that rm.lock file and my my you know markdown file as a docrmd. Right now, it's installing the rm package itself to sort of get itself ready to to go, um, and then it's going to run an rm restore, which is going to pull all of those outside packages in uh, and and get them running. Um, this is already running about twice as long as it has any time in practice on this step. So I have a feeling we may have to resort to the backup, but I can let it run for a few more seconds. Um, you can see in this, uh, in this Docker file, I have it do something though. This CMD command means do a thing. And in this case, it's going to run an R markdown render and render my, uh, R markdown document. All right. It's taking 50 seconds just to install RN. We're going to stop that. We're going to use the backup here. Um, and so uh, I'm going to create a new folder for my results. And then I'm going to run my Docker container. And what this, that this part is going to do, it's going to pipe the results into this, uh, pipe the, the results from inside the container out into my, my results folder. 
Um, the main thing I'll, uh, right, just to remind, right, the reason this is going to do anything is this command line. This says Docker, when you run, actually do a thing. So let's let's hit it. It's running. And what you're seeing is it's, it's running this R markdown render. And the main thing to notice here, and the people reason people love Docker, the results, right, that was a new folder I just created. It's got some stuff in it now. The, the, the main thing I just want to note is that, like, that ran almost as fast as running an R markdown document locally. And this is why people love Docker, because... Um, you can run stuff almost as fast in in a Docker container as just like knitting in the in the IDE, and that's pretty awesome. That I just stood up a standalone development environment um, and and still you know could could do that uh, uh, in in the Docker container, and then it took almost no extra time. So I know I'm right up here at time. That's what I wanted to show. And so a couple little last things. Thank you. First, thanks for for tuning in. Um, so. Uh, 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 reproducibility, happiness, RN, repository snapshots, Docker. So good. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, you think this kind of thing is cool, uh, I am working on a book called DevOps for Data Science. Uh, you can read a draft. Uh, there are a few draft chapters there. It's supposed to be out in June, so I've got a little time, but working on it. Um, and then lastly, I'm hiring on my team. If you think this stuff is cool, you're really interested in the intersection between sort of uh, uh, administration and uh, data science, please reach out. Twitter is probably the best way to get me. Um, happy to talk. The other kind of folks we're looking for is we're looking for managers on my team. Uh, so people who, particularly if you've led a data science team, maybe done a little bit of admin stuff um, and are really excited about sort of growing people and growing teams, I would love to talk to you. Please reach out. Uh, Twitter is the best way to get me. So thanks.